Coffee. Connie's favorite cookies are all out front, all homemade and brought in tonight just for your pleasure. All right, good evening, everyone. This is the uh, April 16th, 2018 Denver Regional Council of Governments board meeting. We ask you to please all join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. Elise Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Here. Chrissy Fanganello? Anthony Graves? Here. Kevin Flynn? Here. Roger Partridge? Laura Thomas? Here. Ron Angles? Libby Zabo? I'm here. Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? Here. David Spellman? Aaron Brockett? Here. Margot Ramsden? Here. Lynn Baca? Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Here. Tammy Maurer, Here. Catherine Heider, Laura Crispin, Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Linda Olson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Carolyn Scharf, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Jim Dale, Paul Hazeman, Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Hello. Dana Gutwein, Jacob LeBure, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Here. Jacob Lofgren, Here. Wynne Shaw, Here. Joan Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Colleen Whitlow, Joyce Pelazuski, Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Jordan Sowers, Julie Mullica, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Rita Dozal, Here. Jessica Sandgren, Here. Herb Atchison, Here. Bud Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Present. Bill Van Meter, Here. and we have a quorum. Ms. Sullivan. Is your new alternate here tonight? No, it's not. Okay. Would you like to tell everyone who your new alternate is? Uh, yes. Our board had a, an election a couple weeks ago, and we have a new alternate. His name is Barney Dreistad. He will be the mayor pro tem for Lyons. Good. Thank you very much. Congratulations to Barney. <laughs> and we also have a new member from Bomar, Margot Ramson. So we'll welcome you, Margot. Thanks for coming tonight. All right, at this point, we're going to move to approve the agenda. I have a second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Good. First up, Mr. Rex, presentation on mobility choice. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, we're delighted this evening to have um, uh, representatives of the uh, consulting team, HDR, to today to give you an update on mobility choice. And just to refresh your memory, um, this was an initiative we undertook in partnership with both CDOT and RTD and the Metro, uh, Denver Metro Chamber. Um, golly, it seems a while ago now. Um, but we're happy that it's kicked off finally. And um, Chris is here, and he's going to be giving us updates on this quarterly, I believe, throughout, throughout the process. And um, so just to refresh your memory again, it's, it, it was primarily, you know, it's about technology, right, and innovation in, in, the, uh, in the mobility space. We all know it's coming, so the question is, is whether we can harness that type of mobility and innovation to help us with our uh, present and future mobility needs. So uh, Chris Primus, who is the uh, deputy project manager on the team, he's here and he's going to present to you all today. Chris is also a past staff member of Dr. Cog, so we all always like welcoming back family. Mm. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Uh, chair and uh, members of the board, thanks for your time tonight. 
I'm Chris Primus with HDR. Our project manager is uh, Rick Pilgrim. He, is, he sends his regrets because he could not make it tonight. Um, also one of, my, one of the leads on the effort is my uh, colleague Kaya Nesbitt. Um, so we are here to answer your questions tonight. This presentation was uh, presented to RTD, the RTD board, uh, last week. And um, earlier, uh, yesterday, we presented it to the Dr. Carr RTC. And earlier today, it was presented to the CDOT Transportation Commission. So we're happy to join you tonight. Um, so why are we here? There are um, you know, pressing concerns in the Denver area. Uh, it's an area that's continuing to grow uh, very rapidly. Uh, the graphic on the left there shows in the blue line the population uh, growth over the last 15 years. And uh, in 2015, there was about 3.1 million people in the Denver metro area. And that's projected to grow to about 3.9 million by the year 2030. The, also, the graphic on the left depicts the transit ridership. That's the red line, and it's had ups and downs. Uh, the bar graph on the left depicts uh, uh, transit riders per capita, and that has been kind of at a level uh, state of affairs over the last several years. Um, uh, the graphic on the right uh, depicts the vehicular side of the regional transportation system. The red line at the top is uh, VMT per capita, which is, you know, right around 25 miles per day. Uh, that's projected into the future. That axis is a, is a projection as, uh, as well as historical information. Um, the bar graph on the right shows the VMT per day. Uh, right around in 2015, it was around 82 million per day. And uh, in 2030, the horizon planning year for the study uh, is projected to be around 104 million per day. Um, given this situation in the Denver area, there's also the rapid changes in technology that are affecting mobility. Uh, for the purposes of, of the study, we've grouped them into five different bins, if you will. Uh, the one is what we call enabling technologies. That is the hardware and the software that makes it all happen, the fiber optics, the communication channels and cables, and that sort of uh, uh, equipment. Uh, another bin is the safety bin that is, uh, includes avoidance uh, technologies, warning systems, um, uh, pedestrian warning systems, and, and that type of information. Uh, another bin is the monitoring and detection bin, is what we call it. That's for data collection, uh, monitoring conditions of the environment uh, with all different types of technologies to do that. A fourth bin that we have is operational optimization that is uh, smart traffic signals, smart uh, transit signal priority systems, uh, and other equipment like that. And finally, there's the mode, what we call the mode, uh, mode bin. Uh, there's changes there that are due to new technologies uh, offered by the transportation network companies, such as Uber and Lyft, for ride hailing and ride sharing and bicycle sharing and, and that type of thing. Many times these technologies are driven very fast by the uh, private sector. It's the businesses. The business world is very fast. The public sector, the one that we operate in, is typically a little bit slower to keep up and catch up with all these technologies. So what is our key question really for this mobility choice study? It is our problem statement, so to speak. And as a unified metropolitan region, how, I, how might we enable more accessible and effective transportation mobility choices to enhance the quality of our social, cultural, and economic life now and in the future? So how are we planning for our mobility future? Well, the study is quite unique uh, from our perspective. It, it involves the three uh, transportation planning agencies that work together in the metro area, RTD, CDOT, and Dr. Cog. But it also involves um, the private sector through the Denver Metro Chamber. And that's quite a unique aspect. And as we've been doing some of our peer research, um, that is unique to have the private sector at the table in a, a planning study like this. So what is the Mobility Choice Blueprint? It is um, how to take advantage of these new technologies to improve our quality of life and our economic well-being. 
um, that mentions, that statement up there mentions policies, programs, and projects. And really what we're thinking of is pilot projects for, for this study to come out with. So um, this blueprint, uh, its study area is the Dr. Cog planning area. The horizon year is the year 2030. Um, and there's a variety of uh, uh, specifics that we're going to investigate through this study. Uh, we're going to analyze travel trends and technologies that seem to be the best fit for the Dr. Cog area. We're going to outreach to residents and stakeholders to understand their mobility challenges and what they see as likely uh, and what sort of new technologies they're interested in. Uh, we're going to uh, explore different types of technologies and through scenario planning and compare and contrast uh, op options. We are going to uh, work with the uh, private sector to identify opportunities for collaboration beyond this study as well as some initial pilot projects. And we're going to put together a framework uh, for aligning the transportation investments of the transportation planning agencies in this area. So what's our approach? We have three dimensions to our approach. Uh, one is what we call the technology transformation. And you can see over on the right the various aspects that includes those on-demand services, shared, shared uh, mobility services, electric vehicles, driverless, or also many times referred to as autonomous, and connected vehicles. We've termed uh, under this umbrella of the mobility category to cover the transportation, transportation agency aspects of uh, programs and policies and uh, funding of these opportunities as well as the pilot projects I just mentioned. And the third and a very important aspect is what we call the livable communities. And that's where it all comes together because the whole idea is to improve our quality of life of all of our communities throughout the region. And you can see some of the aspects there we're considering are health and wellness, so social equity, environmental concerns, urban form, and very importantly, economic vitality. So how will we develop the blueprint? Well, we will have scenarios, multiple scenarios to compare and contrast. We are um, going to assess a variety of things. These are just six, six examples. But you know, travel options, congestion, the effect on congestion of these different uh, scenarios and opportunities, air quality, uh, active transportation modes, and the like. So where are we at? We are in the end of our input phase in April. We are um, going to wrap up by the end of the year, as you can see there. The input phase has, or through our process, we will be conducting four workshops. Uh, the first one's already occurred, and that was where we uh, looked at the, um, and considered the forces of change that are confronting us as a community for transportation. Uh, the second workshop is actually this Friday, and that is where we're going to be focusing on gaps uh, of, that we have assessed uh, in those three spheres, in the community, in the technology, and the uh, mobility transportation agency policies. Uh, the third workshop is later this spring, and that's where we will focus on the develop development and identification of the scenarios that we're going to compare and contrast in the early part of the summer. And finally, in the fall, We'll have workshops to review the draft recommendations. Um, the public outreach consists of, in the earliest part of the stages, uh, an ethnography aspect where we conducted in-depth interviews with about 20 people in their homes and got an in-depth understanding of their uh, uh, understanding of their mobility opportunities and challenges and how they live their life regarding transportation. And the next phase is already underway, which is the digital uh, outreach phase. And uh, we are not conducting traditional open houses or public meetings for this. It's a large study area, of course, uh, and it's a different type of study. And we are conducting a digital outreach program, which starts off with this mobilitychoiceblueprintquiz.com. And it is uh, a 
it is planned to assess people, and as they answer the questions of the quiz, again, we get a framework of how they view their mobility options and the type of travelers who they are and their opportunities and constraints regarding mobility. Um, so far, it just was launched last week, uh, and we've already had 500 responses, but we encourage you to take it yourselves and uh, have fun with it and answer the questions and to spread it through your various jurisdictions through your email lists as much as you can so we can get a good dispersal of, of answers on it. Um, so what are the expectations? Where are we headed with this? The blueprint is not a plan. It will not be a plan per se, but it will be a framework of recommendations on uh, how to move forward regarding technology for the Denver metro area. Um, so it will include uh, recommendations on how to move ahead with collaboration between the three major planning agencies regarding technology. Uh, we will have recommendations for pilot projects that involve our private sector partners. Some of those uh, private uh, endeavors already involved with the Mobility Choice Initiative um, include Panasonic, IHS, Kaiser Permanente, uh, Vail and Associates and others. Um, and we also will, of course, identify how the uh, recommendations on how to move forward with the technologies that seem to fit the best needs for Denver uh, as it is today. Um, thank you. Anybody have any questions? Thank you for coming, and, and it was a great presentation. I had a quick question in regards to the 20 people that you did in home, their, their interviews. Where were they located at? So we use, the, the ethnography is part of the overall, overall public outreach, and we use a separate agency, a recruiting agency, to select those respondents. Um, I, we're not disclosing where their location is, but we do have a, uh, I don't think we have a slide that identifies it, but um, a broad spread of ethnicities, um, locations around the Dr. Cog area, um, broad spread of, of socioeconomic um, and demographic um, locations. So, yes. Sure. And, and so I have a follow-up question in regards to that. So how are we going to be guaranteed that this is going to include the whole region, both the north and uh, south suburban areas, and not just you know, the urban area. Yep, that's a great question, and that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do. And so the challenge we have is that the traditional method of public meetings, we understand is, doesn't also, also can be um, selective and not as broad reaching. So we've tried to take a very creative approach to um, be in people's homes, select people's homes that are across the, the overall Dr. Cog region. Um, and have very in-depth discussions with them, and then use the digital outreach, which includes surveys in both Spanish and English, um, to get a, a broad reach. Through the digital survey that Chris included the, um, the website for, we are asking for zip codes, and we are mapping across the Dr. Cog area where all of those respondents are located. And at our next check-in, we'll be able to show you that overall map of both where the ethnographic conversations happened as well as where the digital and um, uh, handwritten survey respondents are located from, from a, a zip code perspective. So you can look forward to that in our next presentation. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I took the quiz. I was one of those people who took the quiz. Um, I did not agree with how they characterized me, so that was my concern uh, about sharing it with my friends yeah. because it kind of uh, characterized me as a dedicated realist, which I believe is correct, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the bullet points beneath it uh, yep. didn't seem to apply to me. so. Uh, um, I'd be happy to, to talk with someone about that or whatever, but I didn't put in the feedback because there was really too much to
put into the little feedback box. Yep. So as I said, this is this we're trying some creative and new ways of gathering information and also trying to make it fun. So as you saw with the quiz, the types of questions that we asked and also characterizing every uh, the respondents in a persona um, was sort of a unique attempt. Mm -hmm. We understand that um, any time you try to put somebody in a box and label them, it may not quite fit. And that's why we added on to the quiz the opportunity to provide feedback. We're really looking forward to that feed feedback because that will help us improve the quizzes in the future. We also understand that um, the, you know, the, the quiz in, in and of itself gives you a final response, but all the questions that lead up to that are part of what we're looking for. So when we analyze the data, we're as interested in how you answered each of the questions as we are what your final, the, the final persona is actually less important than your answers to the questions leading up to that. Good, thank you. Okay, Chris, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to forego the uh, Regional Transportation Committee because you're going to see everything that we had on the agenda yesterday <coughs> tonight. So that will help some there. Mr. Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Uh, our, our committee met and we talked about uh, further uh, discussion on the workshop agenda. Uh, we had Executive Director Evaluation Survey. That should be coming out in early May. We look for a uh, strong uh, response so we can get good data. And we, start, we started our discussion on the conflict of interest and ethic issue. So we had um, legal counsel, and uh, he, he talked to us about uh, what we have in place. And uh, the uh, committee gave uh, some feedback, and we're going to go forward with that. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Dolzman, if you would, F and B. Finance and budget did not meet this month. Gee, shorter than mine was. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Rex, you're up next. Well, mine's not going to be shorter than yours. Yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> I do have a few, and I know we have a pretty pretty uh, lengthy agenda today, so I will definitely try to be brief. So the award celebration, this is it. We're, on, we're a week out, and um, we have to date 38 directors and alternates that are signed up for, for the event, which is a great number for us, but we strongly encourage you to, uh, if, you can, if you can make it, we would love to have you. Um, it, it officially says that the uh, um, that registrations will close uh, tomorrow. However, um, you know, if if you can't, I'm sure we can we, we can make we can make arrangements for you. But but even if you you know you want to go, you just don't want to fill it out. We'll fill it out for you. So just just let me know before we leave here today, and we'll be happy to do it. Now, just to remind everybody, um, the event is on the, um, on the 25th, and um, the reception is at six o'clock at the at the Grand Hyatt downtown here. And the program begins at, at, at 7 o'clock. The governor will be give, giving the keynote uh, remarks. Um, and we do have a, you know, a really impressive slate of award winners representing projects and people from all over this, this region and communities included. Um, so we're, we're really excited about that. There's also um, an opportunity to say thank you to our outgoing chair, uh, board chair, Bob, Th uh, Bob Roth. I was going to say Bob Pfeiffer. <laughs> Bob, Bob Roth. Hey, man. He, he, uh, he mentioned he only has 30 minutes of remarks he's going to make at that at the thing, so you, you can uh, you can be prepare for that. Um, so anyway, that's it. That's it on the awards center. We hope to see everybody there. We're really excited about it. We're expecting over 400 people in attendance, so it's a it's a pretty big event for us. And I do want to thank uh, our communications and marketing staff. This is a big lift every year, and um, the amount of work they put in is just ridiculous. And I I. I think I, I hope I speak on behalf of the board to thank you all for that. Um, Small Communities Hot Topics Forum, we have scheduled the next one of those. It's Wednesday, May 30th. It's the third in our series. Um, Flo Rotano, who's our uh, Director of Partnership and Innovation, um, some of you may know this, some of the new board members may not. She's a former mayor of Dillon, so she, uh, she has a so have profound interest and a personal interest in uh, in, in small communities, and I, these have always been very well attended and well received. So I would encourage you to uh, to participate in this. the uh, the uh, The upcoming topic is uh, regional economics 101. 
How to Run with the Big Dog. So we're, uh, we're excited to, to get this one going. Our chief economist here at Dr. Cog, Dan Jarrett, as well as Sam Chapman from the Federal Reserve will be among the speakers at that event. So please register. If you have questions, contact Flo and uh, she'll direct you to the right place. <clears throat> um, as part of our ongoing partnership with the Urban Land Institute, Dr. Cog and ULI are bringing uh, ULI's Urban Plan Training Program to Colorado. Um, just, I'm sure you don't know what the Urban Plan is. It's a realistic exercise, it's an engaging exercise where participants learn uh, more about the fundamental forces um, that affect real estate development in, in, in our communities. Um, the workshop, w workshop is ideal for local decision makers who, who like to learn a little bit more about the forces that shape the built environment and um, the important leadership roles that uh, elected and appointed officials play in the real, real estate development process. So um, this, is, this is a pretty cool event. Uh, we would strongly encourage all of our board directors and alternate, alternates to participate in this. Um, we will be hosting the first one, um, and that is uh, July 16th at our new office location, and we'll talk about that more over the next, next, uh, next, few, next few meetings. Let me see here. Well, speaking of building, let me give you a quick update on that. Um, we are on schedule, knock on wood. We've had a few minor things, a few minor hiccups, but uh, everything seems to be going well. Um, we're currently scheduled to move on June, the weekend of June 9th. Uh, so assuming everything goes well, our, um, our June meeting, um, which I'll talk about here in a minute also, will we'll be held at that location. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's going really well. We're, we're excited to, uh, to, uh, to get to our new, new place for sure. I would also like to point out that I don't know if everybody knows this, but CDOT is also moving. Um, and they expect to be in their new offices um, kind of fully and totally in, the, in their new space uh, in the middle of May. Um, the actual address is, I always say, it's in, it's in the parking lot of Mile High Stadium. <laughs> it's, south, it's the south parking lot of Mile High Stadium. <laughs> right. It's the corner of Federal, Place, Federal Boulevard and Howard Place. Great, thank you. I know, know staff's excited to get over there as well. Um, just so everybody knows, our new location, I did, probably should mention that, is 1001 17th Street. So it's at the corner of 17th and Arapaho. It's the old Mountain Bell building. And the, uh, the last item, I, Mr. Chairman, I would like to mention is that, um, as, as is typical uh, for our June board meeting, it, it conflicts with the CML conference, and I know many of you are planning on attending that. So um, we are, we will, uh, we're planning to move that meeting um, to June 27th, which is the fourth Wednesday of the month. I hope that does not cause um, anybody too much consternation. Uh, we will, you know, it, in the event we don't need the meeting, we will cancel, but just because of where we are in the TIP process, we'd like to have it on the calendar in the event that we do need it. So, so uh, please mark your calendars for, Jan, for July, or, sorry, June 27th, and, uh, but we'll be getting additional information out to you all to make sure um, that, that you're, you're properly notified and all that kind of good stuff. The good news is we are going to cancel the July work session. It's on 4th of July, so we figured you probably got other plans. I'll be here. No, I won't. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the public comments. We allow up to 45 minutes for public comments, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Randall Loeb. I'm a citizen here in Denver. I've worked in homeless issues for about 20 years. I was at your first place down in the uh, Glendale area when, you, when I first came to your meetings. Uh, I was chronically homeless, I'm bipolar, I'm 67. Uh, many of the people in my uh, uh, type of work, uh, they die long before they're supposed to be. It's high time when we talk about mobility, development, that we talk about unhoused people. We talk about families being safe and sound. In Finland, they reduced homelessness to one 23-person shelter for the entire country. In Glasgow, Scotland, 
they did similar things through something called Housing First. All of the people, rural and urban, suburban, I don't care which ones they are, um, have a responsibility to protect the most vulnerable citizens. As I age more and more, um, and I notice a few other people with gray hair, um, then you have to basically plan for that. When I went to the Metro Visioning um, project on uh, doubled up people, I was fascinated that over half the people there, and I'm exaggerating by 5%, um, live in doubled up illegal um, sh uh, uh, shared um, places uh, because of poverty. They expect that that meeting, we talked about it, that to escalate. We need to be careful that we don't push out citizens that are generally um, at risk by virtue of their age, their circumstances, their, uh, their identification as a citizen just simply because of the fact of economic development as it was pointed out by the person who used to work for Dr. Cog. We must take care of all of us and I appreciate your time and I would love to someday make this presentation an hour or so. Thank you. Do you have anyone else? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Move on to the consent agenda. At this time, on the consent agenda of the minutes of the March 21st meeting, we would entertain a motion to accept the minutes. I have a so move, a second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? Hearing none, the motion is carried. Moving on to item number 10, discussion of the appointments to the Finance and Budget and Performance and Engagement Committee. We have uh, the recommendations of the nominating committee that are in your packet for the night. Is there anyone else from the floor that would like to be nominated for either of those two committees? Mr. Vidim? I would like to be uh, nominated for a fund for Finance and Budget. Okay. Any others? If whoever makes the motion would also include the name of uh, being added as an amendment to the list that was provided by Mr. Uh, Mr. Vidim, I would appreciate it. Mr. Baker, I see you're moving for the mic. You're up. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to um, move that we accept the, to appoint the members of the Finance and Budget and Performance and Engagement Committees as, pr as pr proposed but amended with uh, the addition of Director Vidim to the uh, Finance and Budget Committee. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion from the membership? Seeing none, those all in favor by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Anybody who doesn't want to vote? Okay, moving on. The next item up is going to be a little bit harder. On the RTC, we have two standing members. The current membership is Mr. Roth and Mr. Rakowski. Mr. Roth has said that he's going to move on to bigger and better things, whatever that is. <laughs> and we require a re-election of Mr. Rakowski if, he, uh, if you so choose, but we also have a list that is also in your packet with one addition tonight. Whatever it turns out, we are electing two members as permanent members those who are not elected are in your packet, and there was one addition that was late. Mr. Odoricio, as the alternate from Adams County, was interested in still being an alternate. So we, out of the packet, add his name to the list. We will need you to vote for two members. All those not receiving votes for the full membership will automatically become alternates. Well, that would leave approximately five people for alternates, and we're glad to have all five. So. Ms. Garcia is passing around election ballots. Is there anyone who does not understand who's up and who's on the list? Do we need to provide the names for anybody? Ms. Peck. Thank you. I would like to uh, withdraw as an alternate from the list. Okay. In that case, uh, also look at your list that Ms. Peck is on there, but she's asked to withdraw from the consideration of the alternates. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, just because I'm, I'm, I'm built this way, I, I, I would like to read those, those names that, are, um, um, that, that have expressed interest. So it's uh, Directors Beacom, Dale, P 
Partridge, Shaw, and Teal have all expressed interest in becoming a member. And I'm sorry, and, uh, and Director Rakowski. Yes, ma'am. A, a point, uh, just basically a, a privilege here for one that I'm, I'm a little concerned about the RTC, about what time of the day that it actually is um, when they have it. Since a majority of the people sitting here are part-time and they hold full-time jobs and the meetings for the RTC is during the day, I believe in the morning. 8 Early, 30 in the morning. 8.30 in the morning when a lot of people have to be at work at 8. So, you know, I would like to really have people that sit on the RTC to to make, take it into consideration to possibly move that time so people it would be more inclusive than it is right now um, because basically only those who are either business owners or retired can actually participate in the RTC and I don't know if that's necessarily being inclusive. Yeah, I, I understand your point but I would tell you it can't be moved tonight. No, not tonight. No, yeah. No. So those yeah, I understand that we can discuss that with the RTC group at the potential next time, but that requires uh, not only RTD but the business community, CDOT, and who else? Well, those on the uh, Dr. Cog board. Right. That would take everybody to have to agree, but right now it's held in this room on 8.30 in the morning. We do cancel usually several days in advance if there's not any items, but we try to keep it as close as we can. Mr. Rakowski. I think the point raised by uh, Director Henry is very good, but one other additional thing, there is a Dr. Cog pre-meeting mm -hmm. at 8 o'clock, so it actually starts even yeah, that's earlier. Correct. Yeah, just for the Dr. Cog members, yeah. but the actual meeting itself starts at uh, 8.30. Ms. Thomas. Yes, when I spoke with Commissioner Partridge this afternoon, he indicated that he was not interested in running, that his plate is too full. Okay. I thought maybe he had shared that with you I'm sorry we had not but would you like to fill his spot Miss Thomas no thank you <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. all right we're going to try to Mr. Beacom go ahead I'm sorry. only because I was probably not listening well put your mic on so we can hear you I had Elrod, I, got I just you. didn't face it um, I didn't hear exactly how many people were we voting for two just two people yeah, we're going, to, we're going to try to make sure we got the correct list before we start voting, so hang on a minute. Okay, yes. Ms. Elrod? Can, can you also add to the list um, where the individuals are from? I'm not necessarily as familiar with names as I am with locations, and thank you. Oh, your test. This is a test for the executive director. Okay. Give, us, okay. give us a couple of seconds to make sure we got everybody. So Mr. Partridge is out. Ms. Peck is out. Mr. Roth is out. Mr. Teal, let's go to you. You got your hand up. So, um, just to, to kind of address Eva's concern, um, you know, I've been a um, an alternate on the RTC for several years now. Um, I've had the good fortune of only having to turn down one meeting, and it was the one that we had uh, this week. And I had to turn it down because I'm the vice chairman of another board and commission uh, that uh, had to meet at nine o'clock and so as I expressed uh, I couldn't in good conscience make that one. Um, Eva I think your point is salient though I mean so many of us who do sit in this board were part-timers I would be uh, if if you guys would like to elect me I'd be happy to bring that up as an item of consideration at some time on the RTC. Okay. Mr. Odoricio you had a comment. Um, I, I think that's a we appreciate that, Mr. Teal. And uh, one of the things I would ask is, it, it sounds like there's a little confusion about who's on the ballot right now. So yeah, I'm going to read any, them off. Is there off. any way to put it up on the screen yeah, and just just it do it and say who's who who? What are your choices for? Yeah, we. Uh, so hang on, we're, we're trying to work through it. Yeah, so just a recommendation, and and where they come from. Yeah. No. For each one. All right, while, while we're doing this, we'll, we'll let this one set for just a minute. So give us a couple of seconds to see if we can get it all worked out. Is there any other comments before while we're putting the list together? Any other that want to volunteer to be a volunteer? Anybody that wants to hide? Okay. I 
Are you guys doing anything for Mark? Yeah, your name's up there. Yeah. Are you on there? Why aren't you on here? Thanks, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was confused as how many of them. There you go. Mike, blow that up there. <laughs> Make it bigger. Yeah, can you make it bigger, please? There you go. And what about Steve? Steve needs to be on there, I think, doesn't he? Oh, he wants to be. Yeah, these are these are just those that have expressed an interest in being a member. Now you sh you choose two of these this five. That's right, is it Steve? No. Uh, go ahead and uh, add my name if you want. What was that? Well, well there's a lot of... <laughs> I, I would thank the, the voting member of Adams County for controlling her alternate, if you would, please. Okay, is everybody okay? Everybody got their votes down? Please seal your ballots. Mail those in by the first of the month. Again, that's <laughs> you're voting for two. Yeah. Do you have yours? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Graves, while we're gathering ballots, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one quick uh, housekeeping uh, note, actually following up with Director Odoricio. I think that for all matters related to placement of members on committees that we should always do this to post, and I think it would actually be helpful to have the agenda posted during the meeting instead of the generic messages about the, the purpose of the body. Thank you. That is such a good idea. We know where he's from. Okay, does everybody have their ballots in? Did we miss anybody? Did anybody get missed that wants to be one of the two board members? Okay, while this is being counted, we'll move on. Amendments to the Metro Vision, Mr. Calvert. He is not there, he is. I didn't see you hiding back there, Brent. No, we were telling Jacob that's why he's hit as far away from the computer as possible, so you're not the one that gets asked to spell names <laughs> in front of everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brad Calvert, I am the director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, here at Dr. Cog. And so you actually have two somewhat related items um, back to back. Um, I'm going to present this one, then Jacob Rieger is going to present the next one. Uh, I believe this is attachment E in your packet. Uh, I think it's page 32 of the electronic version, if that's not right. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, a few things that are in your packet. You've got a memo from staff. You have a draft re resolution, and then the presentation uh, I'm going to walk, through, walk you through this evening. Uh, as I mentioned, you've got back to back items, which may be interrupted by what Connie's doing um, right now. Uh, but these items in general have been sort of bundled uh, through the process. Uh, they are both amendments to the MetroVision plan, which I'll cover, and the regional transportation plan, which, as I mentioned, Jacob will cover. Uh, they were jointly part of a public review period. They were a joint, jointly covered during a public hearing. But for the sake of simplicity, we've split them uh, in terms of actions, in part to save you from like a four-page uh, resolution with way too many whereases. So hopefully um, you can sort of keep these two straight. So. Uh, just a few slides uh, this evening. Um, this material has been covered uh, at, a, at the February work session uh, of the board. Uh, you also had a presentation at the public hearing uh, last month. Um, as noted on the slide, uh, the Dr. Cock Board of Directors has uh, adopted an, uh, a shared aspiration for uh, the future of the region over many, many decades of the existence of, of Dr. Cog. Uh, for the past two decades, this has been under what we have referred to as the MetroVision plan. 
Uh, the board adopted the most recent Metro Vision plan in January of last year. Um, and as no, again noted on the slide, it's been a longstanding uh, value and, and, and tradition of the board uh, to have regular opportunities for stakeholders uh, and the public to suggest changes uh, to the plan as well as uh, less regular, uh, more substantial updates, uh, much like the one that really um, uh, ended with the adoption of the plan uh, back in January. Um, I'm you're going to I'm going to run through several uh, uh, recommended amendments to the plan. All of those come uh, with a recommendation from Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, as noted previously, in general, we think of the update process as an op as an invitation to our stakeholders to suggest uh, amendments to the plan. But from time to time, staff actually initiates uh, changes to the plan for board consideration, and this, this falls under, uh, under that um, uh, sort of amendment. Uh, this was really something we did discuss uh, with the work session participants back in February. Uh, it really is an amendment to one of the performance measures in the plan. Uh, the MetroVision plan includes 13 overall uh, plan performance measures to measure our progress towards uh, regional targets throughout the life of the plan. Uh, we are suggesting a few amendments uh, related to one of those performance measures. Uh, those are noted in the memo as well as um, on the slide. Uh, in general, um, the measure uh, we are suggesting a, a change to the name. That's the sort of the most left-hand side uh, of uh, the, the table that you see in front of you. That is really to just more clearly re uh, reflect uh, really kind of what's the underlying calculation uh, associated with the measure. And then as we mentioned in February at the work session as well as at the, at the hearing um, last month, the other two sets of, of uh, staff recommended changes are based on an error that staff made um, in calculating this measure and a proposed target while the board was having active conversations about what this measure should be. I can go into the details um, about that, but um, a really um, sort of innocuous error that we just discovered as we were actually gearing up to share with the board um, our first round of uh, performance measure reporting uh, associated with, with the document. So that's, that's, that's a staff-initiated change, so obviously it does come with a staff recommendation, though we did spend some time uh, talking about some alternatives uh, with the board back in, in February. Uh, as, as noted earlier, um, on, in terms of the, the call for uh, uh, plan amendments, uh, we initiated that call back in October, uh, both for the RTP as well, for the, as, as well as for the MetroVision plan. Uh, Dr. Cog received uh, four proposed amendments, all related to urban centers. Um, so the plan currently recognizes 104 urban centers um, in the plan. And so this is a pretty common amendment uh, process that we have when we do these more regular uh, amendments. Uh, per board policy, there's actually an external evaluation panel that reviews those proposals along with uh, Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, based on input from that evaluation panel, as well as our own uh, staff level review, we, have, we are recommending uh, three uh, uh, amendments to existing urban centers. In every case, these three urban centers are already uh, recognized in the MetroVision plan. There is just simply an expansion of, of those urban centers that were proposed by uh, a member of government. Um, if, if the board chooses to adopt uh, these amendments this evening, really what you are seeing is what would be updated would actually be the area associated with, uh, uh, with each of those uh, urban centers. And I've just got a quick series of maps just in case you're curious as to what that uh, sort of looks and feels, feels like. Uh, so for the Denver, sponsor, uh, Denver sponsored amendment related to the East Colfax Main Street, they're simply just extending uh, their easternmost boundary from basically Colorado Boulevard um, out to Yosemite. Uh, in Highlands Ranch uh, in Douglas County, uh, Douglas County promote, uh, proposed an expansion of the Highlands Ranch uh, Town Center uh, to really include additional focal points for urban development within the county, uh, including uh, planned tra transit station. And then uh, with Inglewood, um, Inglewood is proposing an expansion of their existing city center uh, urban center uh, to include other districts recently analyzed um, in their comprehensive plan update. What this urban center now does is it, is it includes um, all of the areas within the city that are covered by the, their most intensive uh, zoning district classifications. They're all now housed uh, within uh, a single center. Uh, so that's really it for a very high level overview of the amendments that are before you this, this evening. Um, as I mentioned, each of these come with a recommendation from Dr. Cox's staff. Um, as noted in the memo, we did not receive um, any, comment, any public comments related to these amendments uh, during the public review period or during the public hearing uh, last month. 
happy to answer any questions from the board. Uh, as uh, And I will f note there is a uh, proposed motion in the memo associated with this item. Okay. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Brad. Uh, on the Englewood uh, map, is that just a drawing error that it seems to show the area on the west where the light rail station is to be taking, taken out of the existing? Yeah, that, that's, that, okay. thank you for that, yes. All right. Thank you. Good, good question. Ms. Elrod. Um, apart from what you just showed us here that the area has increased, does this affect anything else in the plan, like metrics or anything like that? Uh, yes, well, potentially. So I'll, I'll give you um, a few examples. So as I mentioned, I showed this table, right? So when you think of the plan document itself, really the only change is really that, that strike through that you see and replace with a new uh, area. It's a very good question. Um, we have several measures that are related to um, population and employment growth within urban centers, right? So now that these areas are larger, there is the opportunity that you would actually see uh, some change uh, to that metric. Um, as we've sort of talked with um, over several measures, um, there are multiple ways to show progress on that. One of those is to simply have more areas that are covered by either urban centers or areas served by high capacity transit. Uh, the other thing is obviously to see more intense um, growth and development within those areas. So yes, there may be some sort of subsequent uh, impact as well. Other comments or questions from any member of the authority? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the staff recommended amendments to the Metro Vision Plan. Do we have a motion? So moved. Have it so moved. Mr. Graves, second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, motion is carried. Thank you. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog. So this is part two. We just talked about MetroVision, and now we're going to talk about the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. So many of you have seen this slide before, and I won't belabor it, but just, you know, the quick overview of our overall planning framework obviously starts with our MetroVision plan that Brad just presented. Uh, within our MetroVision plan and helping to implement MetroVision is our MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, and within that is sort of the piece of it that, um, that sets the vision for the region, our, our multimodal transportation system. And then within that vision is the piece of that vision that we can actually afford to implement uh, by 2040 based on the revenues that we think we'll have available. We call that the fiscally constrained uh, regional transportation plan. And then obviously we work our way down to the tip of the projects that we're funding and constructing over the next four years. So for the uh, 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, um, and I don't like to use acronyms in presentations, but I would like to say 2040 MVRTP because um, it's just such a long title. Um, you know, what is this thing? I've said it helps implement MetroVision. It is our federally required MPO long-range transportation plan for the entire region. Um, so it's a federal requirement itself, and it helps us meet several federal requirements, not the least of which is that if you have a large capacity project that you want to fund through the TIP, it first needs to be in the long-range plan. Um, I said it, prevents our, it presents our region's vision, vision for a multimodal transportation system. And then within that vision, it does identify uh, the, the component of that vision, the subset of the vision that we can actually implement both projects and programs and services and everything that it takes um, to create and maintain uh, a multimodal transportation system uh, based on, again, on the revenues that we think will be available, federal, state, local, and other revenues through 2040. Um, it does individually identify those major roadway capacity and rapid transit projects. We map those and list those in the plan. We do a major update every four years per federal requirements. Uh, what we're doing now is uh, that more frequent amendment cycle, what we call cycle amendments, and that's really what this was. Um, this is a table, and this is in your packet, of the requested uh, project amendments. Um, so along with MetroVision, we have this call for amendments, open up to project sponsors um, who ask for amendments to their projects within the plan, um, as shown both on this table 
and then on this map. We really have three types of, of amendments. Uh, we have new projects, uh, primarily from CDOT, uh, requested to be amended into the plan. Uh, particularly for CDOT, those amendments are coming from really the first two years of Senate Bill 267 dollars uh, that are starting to flow to CDOT. Uh, we have one or two projects that are actually removed from the plan by local governments, and that happens once in a while. Um, that they ask for a project to be removed. And then we have some projects that are already in the plan um, and we stage the projects in our plan in what we call air quality staging periods. And these are 10 or five year periods of, you know, when we expect these projects to be implemented uh, between now and 2040. So some projects that are already in the plan, the project sponsor said, hey, I want to move, you know, usually move up those projects into a sooner or earlier uh, air quality staging period. I also want to note for transparency purposes, and I said this to you back in uh, December when I asked you to approve the networks of projects that we would model uh, for traffic and air quality conformity. I mentioned this at the time, and for transparency, want to mention again that in our what's still our current long-range plan, we have three of these air quality staging periods that step us up between now and 2040. Uh, we're proposing to go to two uh, staging periods, basically 2020 to 2029 and 2030 to 2040. Um, so that doesn't affect anything about you know how projects are implemented or the money or nothing substantive. It simply um, changes a little bit illustratively how we display them in the plan. Um, along with project sponsor amendments, um, as with Metro Vision, we took this opportunity for some staff initiated updates. Really what we did here and in your packet was linked to track changes for transparency uh, so that you could see all the changes we were proposing to make to the document. Uh, really, we wanted to fully integrate these amendments that I just showed you into uh, the map and text and tables of the plan. Our old approach is we do kind of a separate summary report without changing the original plan. Now we want to fully integrate into the, uh, the amendments into the plan, keep the plan fresh and up to date. Um, along with that, you know, it's been a year since we originally adopted the 2040 MVRTP last April of 2017. So another year, we have another year of data. So we've refreshed the data in the plan. Um, We've made some, um, I think, relatively minor but strategic text updates. Um, again, the plan is sort of aging quickly. We want to keep it up to date, keep it relevant and useful. And finally, we're creating a new style format and graphic design for the 2040 MVRTP. Um, our communications and marketing staff has done a really great job of just making it a very visual and user-friendly document uh, that I think will just make it much more accessible. And the draft of that uh, was also linked in, uh, in your memo for this. Um, as Brad mentioned for MetroVision, we had a joint 30-day uh, public comment period and then we culminated that with a joint public hearing back on March 21st um, as part of your March board meeting. Um, as Brad mentioned for MetroVision, also the same here mostly. We did not receive any comments during the 30-day public comment period. We did receive one comment during the public hearing. I don't like to single out our board members, but we had one board member make a comment. And for transparency purposes and documentation purposes, I do want to note uh, that our board member from Commerce City, uh, Director Teeter, did make a comment during the public hearing um, in March of supporting uh, the amendments on North, um, uh, North US 85, uh, proposed amendments for interchanges at 104th and 120th, but also noting that that corridor, the North US 85 corridor, is currently going through a NEPA uh, federal project development process. So I did want to note that. Post public hearing, we did have a couple revisions to the ozone conformity document as part of the air quality conformity documentation. Um, so let me see if I can just sort of very briefly uh, explain this in an easy to understand way. Um, recently a court case came out that sort of questioned uh, US EPA's uh, ability or authority to revoke the old 1997 uh, air quality standards. Uh, we're operating under the 2008 standards, right? And the 2008 standards supersede the 1997 standards, but uh, the revocation of those 1997 standards was called into question. Well, the 2008 standards that we are operating under are more strict than the 19, 1997 standards. We do show in the documentation that we do meet the emission budget uh, standards for 2008, so obviously we also meet them for 1997. So just kind of proactively here, we weren't asked to do this. We're just trying to cover our bases proactively. All we did in the document was show both the 2008 and the 1997 standards to make the point that we meet the emissions budget for both of, the, uh, both of those uh, sets of standards. 
Um, also, since the public hearing, we had draft language in the document that we simply updated uh, because this event happened. We anticipated it happening, and now it happened. Uh, so we're updating the language to confirm that it actually did happen, um, that EPA had a finding, what's called a finding of adequacy for those 2008 uh, ozone standards emission budgets. Um, as Brad mentioned from Metrovision, uh, for the 2040 MVRTP, we had several documents that were linked in your uh, packet uh, in the agenda memo for this that were the subject of the public hearing. Basically, we just wanted to be really transparent with you and show um, sort of a summary of what the changes were that I've covered tonight, a track changes version of the document in the appendices, as well as a quote unquote kind of clean version of the document, as well as our air quality conformity uh, documentation that we include every time we amend or update the plan. So speaking of air quality conformity, um, it applies to, remember I said that fiscally constrained piece of the plan, uh, the piece that we think we can actually implement by 2040 based on uh, available revenues. Air quality conformity applies to the 2040 fiscally constrained RTP. Uh, we must address several pollutants, ozone, carbon monoxide, and what's known as particulate matter or PM10 uh, pollutants. The proposed amendments that I've covered here were included in the regional travel model transportation networks. And the air quality conformity analysis that we conduct as part of any time we amend or update the regional transportation plan, it's a regional exercise. So it's the entire fiscally constrained plan. It is not an individual project-based air quality analysis. It's an air quality analysis for the entire plan, fiscally constrained plan, as proposed to be amended. So the good news that I've said already is that uh, the amended 2040 fiscally constrained plan does pass the pollutant emission test for regional air quality conformity. And with that, I will say thank you. Um, both TAC and RTC recommended this for approval. Uh, we do need the motion that's a, a little bit complicated. We need the motion that's in the memo on this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Jones. Just a quick question. When will we have to do our air quality conformity monitoring to include the 2015 ozone standard? <clears throat> Wow. <laughs> well, um, 2015 standards. Um. Well, I mean, I pause because there's so many standards that are yeah. out there now. It's hard to keep track of them. Um, so we have the 2015 standard. The 20, which one was the one that was just passed recently? Was that the 15 or 18? Well, the 2008 standard. No, 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 not those. Um, the air, yeah, the EPA. I believe the area was approved as to what area the 2015 standards apply to. So that has been approved. And then the plan is still under consideration, isn't it? Meaning we haven't heard back yet. So I was just curious, when does our modeling have to start meeting that standard? I didn't mean to stump anyone. <laughs> I, no, I thought it was a basic question. question. Oh, Steve Cook's so, there. Yeah, so we'd like to phone a friend. Steve Cook. And I, and I, I would like to phone uh, Ken Lloyd at the RAP, uh, <laughs> yeah. Regional Air Quality. No, it's, from what I've heard from, from Ken, it's going to be a couple more years before the SIP, the state implementation plan, is prepared for the new o, the 2015 ozone. So the 2015 ozone standard is point, is point 0.7. The one we're working under right now is 0.75. The old one was 0.8. Um, but it's going to be, a, I thought it was like 2021, I think that's right, Steve. In terms of the, yeah. doing the SIP, then once the SIP is done, then we'll have to meet those new budgets. Now, they're starting, I believe, some of the mo their modeling work, the air quality modeling work, in terms of inventory of uh, current producers of the, the ozone uh, pollutants. Uh, the precursors to ozone. So I think it's still a couple years. So just to reiterate then what I think I heard, we don't have to start meeting the, the current standard until we have a SIP in place. That's correct. So we just dig a hole. Well, we don't have a budget, right? Uh, no, it, it's true. I, just, yeah. I was just curious about the process. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Brockett. I just had a curiosity question about that. Those pa the tests that you're passing there. So we've passed. Like, was it close, or do we have a lot of room? Is this something that we worry about as we look at projects and say, "Gosh, we're only five percent away. If we approve this kind of project, we're going to be in trouble." Just, or are we just way, way ahead? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess I'd answer that by saying that sometimes we worry a little bit. Um, here's the truth, though, is we start working our way towards 2040. You know, frankly, we talked about technology earlier this evening. Technology is going to help save us in the sense of um, fuel economy standards and, and those sorts of things, electric vehicles, uh, those sorts of things. So it gets easier the farther out we go. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's sort of those initial years we've, you know, we, we have passed, and we've passed reasonably, not, you know, not something that we worry, worry about, um, but it is closer in those earlier years, and it gets better as we get towards 2040, for sure. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any easier questions? Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Sable? Uh, I was just going to make the motion. Okay, Are we ready? No, not yet. Let me make sure. But I'll let you make the motion if you want to read it the way it's printed. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions before we take the motion? Ms. Sabo, go ahead, please. Yeah, I knew it was time. Move to approve the amended update 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and Associated Dr. Cog, Colorado, and PM10 Conformity Determination and the Denver Southern Sub Area 8 Hour Ozone Conformity Determination. You have a second. <laughs> second. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, Ms. Abel, thank you. Next item, Mr. Todd. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. Chair. So attachment G contains six proposed amendments for your consideration this evening to the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program. The First Amendment is a new project which would add I-25 capacity improvements from Castle Rock to the El Paso County line. Um, this would add one new express lane in each direction. should also be noted that the total project cost by CDOT is $350 million and the, the limits for this extend south of the Dr. Cog boundary into Monument. The second project amendment is for the Central 70 Amendment. Central 70 project. This amendment would decrease the overall funding by $9.1 million due to, due to receiving a better loan rate and therefore better future financing, financing terms to the TIFIA loan. The funding dedicated for construction in this project would remain the same. The next four amendments are all necessary and contingent upon one another to add funds to, on, into the I-25 South PEL project. The first amendment of this four is to the Region 1 RPP, or Regional Priority Program Pool. Um, this amendment would reduce the FY19 funding and transfer it to the US 85 Vasquez project. The second project would, uh, is an amendment to the Region 1 Design Program. This would remove the pool projects in the 2018 funding and transfer it to the I-25 South PEL project. The third is an amendment to the Excuse me, the US 85 Vasquez from 56 to 60 second operational, operational improvements. This is simply a color of money exchange to the project by removing the 2018 regional design program funding and adding 2019 regional priority program funding. The overall funding for this project would remain unchanged. And fourth, as mentioned earlier, for the I-25 South PEL project, this would add 2018 regional design program funding of $3 million, both transferred from the Region 1 design program project and the US-85 Vasquez project. So hopefully that is all easily understood, and I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Comments or questions from the authority? Ms. Henry. Could you explain uh, the adjusting, adjust funds from US-85 to, from I-270? Yes, and that is simply, again, a color of money change, but if there is a CDOT representative who would like to take that question more in detail, would certainly welcome that. Ms. Perkins-Smith, do you want to cover it, or you will got somebody in the audience we want to cover it with? May I ask Danny Herman, is that something you could answer? Thank you. I'm Danny Herman, Planning Program Manager for CDOT Region 1 in the metro area. So if I understand the question, the reason we're doing the swap of the color of funds is we need the 
FY18 funds on the project further south. We have other funding uh, as discussed for the project up north, which so it won't be able to use those funds immediately. So we're just swapping as part of CDOT's cash management. We have less cash on hand than we've had in the past. So we're moving the color of funding around uh, just to keep both projects on schedule. Go ahead, Ms. Henry. So you're guaranteeing that there are funds that are going to be for 270. Do you have plans for that for 85 Vasquez? Yes, so the amendments, as, as Todd said, or as Todd mentioned, are packaged together. So the amendment adding the one and a half million or 1.75 million of uh, RPP going into that project, the des regional design funds that are going to I-25 South, it's contingent upon that swap so that the I-270 Vasquez project is kept whole. So you're, you're taking the money from the 270 program for design and you're moving it up into I-25, so you're taking it from the north end and moving it up to the south end. Am yes, I correct? We're, we're taking the regional design funding from FY18 off of the 270 Vasquez project and programming it to the I-25 South project that can use it this year. And we're replacing that funding with the same amount of FY19 RPP money so that the project stays whole. It's really just a shell game for us to make sure we can utilize the funding sooner and keep both projects on, on track. Okay. I like the colorful language and the color of money. That, that works. <laughs> Other questions or comments from the authority? At this time, I would uh, ask a motion to be made to adopt the attached amendments to the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program. We have a motion. Mr. Chairman, uh, move to adopt the attached amendments to the 2018 through 2021 Transportation Improvement Program tip. Okay, do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. Are there any other questions or comments from the authority? Seeing none, all in favor by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion's carried. Mr. Cottrell, thank you very much, sir. Mr. Papsdorf, you're up. I just made you one. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I had to make my way up from the cheap seats. That's what I get for being the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board. I've got uh, two sort of related issues. This this first um, item is related to the the 2020-23 Transportation Improvement C Program Regional Share Evaluation Criteria. This is an item the board has discussed a couple of times, uh, uh, most recently on March 21st at the board meeting. At that board meeting, uh, there was a request that uh, the 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 weighting factors on a couple of the score criteria be reconsidered by the TIP policy working group. Um, the concept is the, this new concept for the criteria is really based on applicant using qualitative responses supported by quantitative uh, information provided with their applications. Um, the weighting request really uh, asks that we go back and reconsider with the TIP policy working group the 20% weighting factor for the TIP, uh, the criteria relating to the TIP focus Metro Vision objectives. Um, at their, <clears throat> excuse me, at their March 26th meeting, the TIP policy work group uh, took that under advisement, had a pretty uh, robust conversation around a different approach to the weighting factors around uh, those criteria. Um, after their discussion, the policy work group really felt like the weighting for that part 2C relating to the Metro Vision objectives uh, remain at 20 percent. They noted in their conversation that the weighting factor for the TIP policy focus areas that the board has adopted is already at 30 percent. So if you combine those, uh, those Metro Vision related uh, criteria, that's already, that's half of the, um, the weighting for the criteria. So their, their recommendation back to the board is to keep the weighting factor as originally considered. Uh, they also suggested 
Um, they also suggested that in, in agreement with the board, uh, adjusting the um, information required for the, the um, interactions, the relationship, the leveraging with um, multiple partners um, in their contribution amount and the percent of the overall project total that would be included with the application. The working group further recommended listing the partnership um, examples and emphasizing and strengthening the bond to multiple municipality or other subregions in the in the projects. Uh, we we talked about um, also expanding the title to emphasize uh, for part two B the connection to Metro Vision in that criteria section. At the April 4th uh, board work session, we brought that information back to those members that were present at the work session. Uh, we got um, agreement that we should bring this proposal back to the board meeting for your consideration. We've included a recommended motion for your consideration uh, to uh, finalize these criteria for the regional share uh, portion of this 2023 TIP process. Comments or questions from the board? If not, we would entertain a motion at this point. Mr. Pfeiffer. We would make the motion uh, move to approve the TIP regional share evaluation criteria to be included in the 2020-2023 TIP policy document. Is there a second to the motion? I have a second from Ms. Shaw. We have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion from anyone? Seeing none, all in favor by aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. We thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Next one, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, this is related to the regional share portion of the 2020-23 TIP, pro TIP, TIP process. Um, if you recall back at the April 4th board work session, for those that you were present, uh, we presented a recommended process for scoring and developing a, recommend, a funding recommendation for the regional share portion of this next TIP cycle. Um, our goal really is to create a process that is as impartial as possible is authentic, is objective, and has integrity so you have confidence in the, in the funding recommendation process that ultimately makes its way to the board. We described uh, basically a four-step process uh, based on board feedback at that April 4th work session and input from the TIP policy work group. Um, we've developed this proposed process that begins with applications coming into Dr. Cog for the regional share portion of the TIP cycle. Um, we'll uh, then the scoring of those applications, developing a recommendation uh, based on those applications to bring through the, the normal Dr. Cog approval process that includes a recommendation from the Transportation Advisory Committee, um, a recommendation from the Regional Transportation Committee, and then ultimately action and adoption and final approval by the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. I'm going to get into a little bit more detail on some of those steps. So the first step is the applications. They're submitted to Dr. Cog for eligibility, review, and scoring. That's based on feedback that we received from the board at the work session. We had a lot of different, a lot of discussion about sort of who should do scoring. We had talked about an option where we would have an outside review panel um, assist in the scoring or do part of the scoring for part of the criteria. I think there was a good robust discussion at the work session that really uh, directed us to, to uh, bring back a proposal where those, that scoring really happened by Dr. Cog's staff. Um, in, in terms of taking those, those technical scores based on the criteria, um, then we bring in this review panel uh, to look at that technical scoring, have some discussion, be able to really uh, delve a little bit more, more um, deeply into those, into those projects, taking the, score into, in, taking the technical score into consideration, um, and then identifying a top tier of projects that might represent 150 to 200 percent of the total amount of funding available in the regional pot, inviting the sponsors of those projects to come and present their projects to the review panel, and then the review panel be able to take into account the technical scores and the information that they learn from those presentations and their own uh, discussions and debate to formulate a recommendation that would then move through that review process that I referenced. So the big issue is then, and the big discussion uh, at the work session and with the TIP policy work group was what's the formation of this review panel that will assist us in formulating a funding recommendation. 
Um, the direction that we heard at the work session on the 4th was one technical or non-Dr. Cog director from each of the eight sub-regional forums. So we'll be asking each of the sub-regional forums to, um, to nominate a, a representative to be on this review panel. We would have one member from CDOT and one member from RTD, and then a maximum of five regional matter, uh, sub subject matter experts. Um, we're thinking of folks like a representative from Bicycle Colorado, for instance, or the Colorado Motor Carriers Association, or the Regional Air Quality Commission. Um, we will work through identifying kind of who those might be, who they participate. We, we've got a little bit of time to pull that together, but we want your endorsement and your thoughts on this overall process and structure, and we'll be working with the board to, to finalize uh, those up to five um, regional subject matter experts to participate on the review panel. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, entertain your discussion. We do have a suggested, uh, suggested motion um, as part of the item in attachment I. Just, just for the board members who have not been attending that work session, this was a unanimous decision out of the work group to make the changes that you saw tonight to make sure that we keep this as impartial as possible. We keep our individual city and county staffs out of the middle of this and to make it with the add-on of the technical experts coming in from the outside that are not associated with any region so that they have that ability to provide us unbiased recommendations and the expertise that they individually bring. So at this point, are there any questions or comments from the board? Mr. Brockett. I would just say I thought it was a very productive discussion at the work session. I thought we came up with a really good proposal. I'm happy to make a motion when discussion is over. Okay. Let me see if there's any other questions. If not, I'll come back to you, Mr. Brockett. Any other comments or questions from anybody on the board? Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very comfortable with this. I think it's an accurate reflection of the very productive working session discussion. I did want to remind the body that I think it would be uh, productive to have an overview of each of the sub-regional processes that we're cooking up across the metro area at a future meeting. Thank you. Ms. Sullivan. Uh, just a question about the selection of the subject matter experts. Is that going to happen before the applications are received? Or are you going to base that on what the applications look like? Uh, Mr. Chair, Director, I, I, our intent at this point has been to try to identify those subject area matters before the call for projects um, so that um, our, our goal, I think, and based on the, the discussion and the feedback at the board work session was we really want people that have a regional view of transportation and understanding of the transportation issues facing the region. Um, I, I, I don't think the intent was to try to look at the set of projects that get submitted and then try to come up with subject area experts kind of tailored to the projects. We really want people uh, to come and join that review panel that have a broad view of the regional transportation issues that we face. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Walton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could remind me how many we how many sponsor presentations there would be. If I recall, that was going to be a subset. Mr. Chair, uh, Director Walton, the um, the idea is that we would have that review panel based on the technical stores and their initial conversation identify not a number of projects but a set of projects that represented somewhere around 150 to 200 percent of the total amount available for the regional share, just so that in their deliberations and based on the presentations from those project sponsors, they have a good set of sort of the best of the best submittals um, to debate and come up with a uh, final recommended, recommended funding package for the board's consideration. And the board would be able to attend the presentations? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Mr. Brockett, if you would, please. Very good. I uh, move that we approve the method of scoring, recommending, and approving TIP regional share project applications to be included in the 2020-2023 TIP policy document. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any other comments or questions? If not, all those in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Any abstentions? <laughs> motion carries on a majority vote. Thank you. Next item up is Mr. Rieger.
Thank you once again, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, so this item regards uh, measures under the FAST Act. And you'll recall that back in January, uh, you all adopted 2018 safety targets um, that are required under the FAST Act. And at that time, I warned you that we would be coming back to you over the next several months with several other uh, sets of uh, targets that we need to set under the FAST Act. Uh, there's a whole sort of constellation of things that we need to do. So this is the next step in that process of setting, um, setting the next kind of set of targets. Um, these targets are a little bit uh, different in the sense that these two that we're going to talk about tonight are actually joint targets between uh, Dr. Cog and CDOT. Uh, we have worked together both to on the sort of methodology side and the math side, um, and we're also going to give this presentation jointly. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Darius, Darius Pakbaz from CDOT, uh, who will lead us off. Good evening. Um, like Jacob said, my name is Darius Pakbaz, uh, Performance Data Manager within the Division of Transportation Development at CDOT. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about two measures uh, called uh, peak hour of excessive delay and non-SOV travel measures that are required under the rule um, that were established for uh, MAP 21 in the FAST Act that require unified targets between the state and MPO. So um, real quick overview, uh, MAP 21 and the FAST Act established performance measures in three areas, um, as you can see on the slide above. Uh, safety target setting activities have concluded for this year, and we are now in the process of setting targets for infrastructure condition and system performance measures. Uh, the two measures that are, we're going to be talking about tonight fall under the system performance time frame and must be set by May 20th of this year. Next slide. Uh, this is a quick map for uh, just about all the measures they apply to the national highway system within the jurisdiction boundaries. So this map just illustrates the uh, interstates in blue and the other um, national highway system routes in red. Okay, next slide, please. So these two measures are applicable to areas that have NHS, uh, excuse me, national highway system um, routes through their jurisdiction have populations over 1 million and are in non-attainment or maintenance for CMAC pollutants. Um, for this round, uh, for the first four-year uh, performance period, uh, the Denver Aurora area is the only um, qualifying area in the state that has to set this unified target for these two measures. So the first measure, uh, peak hour of excessive delay, um, tries to look at the, uh, tries to quantify the number of hours um, per capita that people experience an excessive delay during peak hours. So the methodology for this measure is for each tenth of a mile section of the national highway system, if the posted speed limit is, uh, excuse me, if the speed is recorded at 20 miles per hour or at 60 percent of the posted speed limit in, in 15 minute intervals, um, it is considered excessive delay, and this is weighted by volume and occupancy factors. So the total excessive delay for all the segments within the jurisdiction are divided by the um, population of the urbanized area, and that's how the measure is, is, is established. The peak hours for, for these measures are 6 to 10 a.m. during weekday mornings and 3 to 7 p.m. in the weekday afternoons. So the data source for this particular measure, um, as, as recommended by FHWA, is the National Performance Measure Research Data Set, um, in addition to our own reported volume and occupancy factors. So um, the current condition from 2016 is about 48 hours of excessive delay per capita, and we have target recommendations of 52 hours of excessive delay in 2020 and 54 hours in 2022. Uh, the measures anticipate a 2.5% increase in the peak hour of excessive delay um, based on increasing population and increase in expected increased number of vehicles using the highway system. And this follows the same methodology that's used for other travel time, measure, uh, travel time metrics and reliability metrics that are reported publicly. Uh, the next measure is the non-single occupancy vehicle travel metric, and uh, this measure is a, the percent of travelers who have reported of using a travel method other than single occupancy um, vehicle, um, including carpool, van, transit, walking, bicycling, or telecommuting. Um, as reported in 2016 for the five-year average, it is at around 24%. The data source for this particular measure is the American Community Survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau. 
and the recommended targets are at 24% for 2020 and 25% for 2022. For these targets, we used a, um, a two-tiered methodology, which is um, to hold the line for the 2020 target to keep the current condition at 24%, and then for the four-year target to align with the Metro Vision target um, of of achieving 35% of non-SOV travel by 2035, so that would show an increase of 1% to 25% in 2022. And for the next slide, I'll turn it back over to Jacob. Okay, so let me say a couple of things about both of these measures. Uh, for the peak hour excessive delay, uh, the sort of methodology that Darius laid out to you, it sounds really complicated, right? Um, that's actually federally prescribed. The methodology, the data source, it's all federally prescribed. So we have um, here at Dr. Cog and, and at CDOT as well, you know, we have different ways of measuring delay and different ways of measuring congestion. Um, but the process we have to use for setting this measure is directly federally prescribed to us. Um, so it sounds a little complicated, but that's what we need to do. What I would say is that um, no matter how you measure it, you know, we know, and we've talked about earlier this evening, we're going to add 1.3 million people to this region by 2040. So this is one of those measures where we're trying to have it be less worse than it otherwise would be, if that makes sense. Uh, so we're trying to strike that balance there. We know that, um, you know, that overall vehicle miles travel is going to increase, congestion is going to increase. Um, so we're trying to strike that balance on that measure. On the uh, non-SOV mode share to work, as Darius mentioned, and here's kind of the slide on that, um, just as we did with safety, we're using our MetroVision plan uh, that we talked about earlier this evening. We do have a performance target in MetroVision uh, to increase the non-SOV, non-single occupant vehicle mode share to work uh, from about 25% to 35% uh, by 2040. So just as we did with the safety targets back in January, you know, we looked at what it would take, what would it take to get us there uh, by 2040 and doing that math sort of on a year-by-year -year basis and using that for the four-year target. For the two-year target, again, given, you know, sort of where we're at and our ability to affect change literally within the next two years, we're proposing to hold the line in the sense of the methodology here on the screen, but clearly, and I want to emphasize, not hold the line um, in terms of the things that we're doing at Dr. Cog, that CDOT and RTD are doing, and that you all are doing in your communities, but really just trying to strike that balance of can we sort of mathematically move that needle literally within two years or, you know, in a way less than two years. Um, where, versus the four-year uh, sort of average. And as we step into this, and Darius, correct me if I'm wrong, we will have an opportunity to reassess uh, these targets in the next year or two? Correct. In 2020, we have an opportunity to adjust the four-year targets. Yeah. So as we get into this and if we see that we need to make a little bit of a course change, we can do that. Um, the last thing I'll say before I turn it back over to Darius, just to emphasize on this, you know, this is important and I don't want to minimize its importance, but this is frankly a little bit of checking the box to meet a federal requirement. This is certainly related to many of the things that we do here at Dr. Cog and that you do at your agencies, but I wouldn't necessarily call it the centerpiece of some of our efforts. We have our MetroVision plan with our performance targets. We have our long-range transportation plan. We have all the work that you're doing. So what we're trying to do here is to use those things that we're already doing to help us sort of meet those federal requirements and set these targets. Um, but this is sort of not the lead thing of what we're doing. This is one piece of uh, the overall framework of what we're doing and what you're doing in your communities. Uh, this will be the, the final slide of, of the presentation. This just gives a basic timeline of um, of what we are doing over the next few months in regards to these measures. So we'll set the statewide targets, including the two targets we talked about tonight on May 20th. We'll report those to FHWA. And for all the other measures in regards to infrastructure condition and system performance, the MPOs have the opportunity to support the state targets or develop their own targets um, by November 15th. So uh, with that, I would like to thank the board for my, the opportunity to speak to you tonight. and. Um, available for any questions that you might have. And I would say, Mr. Chair, just like with the other sort of complicated items we've presented tonight, we do have a motion, a suggested motion, the memo uh, that we need for this item. Okay. Ms. Maurer. Uh, I was just curious, um, how is the non-SOV measure? So the data that is, um, that we're required to use um, from FHWA is the American Community Survey. Um, which um, I don't know how many specific people that are that um, that respond to the survey, but from the survey they report out for their work commute what are the modes that they that they use for it. So it's not 
it, it, it's not hard numbers. It's not actually going out and taking a look at um, specifics and looking at um, uh, ride share of transit or van pool. It's just, it's just a survey conducted by the Census Bureau on an annual basis. Thank you. Mr. Rakowski. Uh, there is, a, if I'm not mistaken, that survey that you referenced is a national survey based, it, based on national numbers? It is a national survey. However, the survey can be drilled down to specific areas, whether it's a statewide number or to a, a local area. So in this particular case, it is the uh, Denver Aurora urbanized area. But it is a nationally conducted survey. So, Director, they report it by county. Um, and, they, and they really just asked the question, you know, what was the primary way that you got to work last week? What we're required to do and what we typically do is we use, they do this every year, they report one year data, which is a smaller sample size. We use the five year data and it's a rolling kind of five year average, uh, which brings some stability to the data. So you bring all seven counties into that? So in our work, just in Dr. Cog and in MetroVision, we use our entire um, you know, our entire Dr. Cog planning area. Um, as Darius mentioned, for this particular measure, again, based on federal requirements, we're using the Denver Aurora urbanized area, which is our core urban area, which is the smaller uh, subset. Okay. I do want to mention that during the RTC meeting yesterday, this question came up, was Uber and Lyft type services included in the survey? And Darius, can you respond to that again? Yeah, um, Uber and Lyft are, are not included in the survey. The survey data goes back to 2012. Um, some of the Uber and Lyft services really got their start as far as expanding nationwide in 2012 and into 13 and 14. Um, I believe we talked a little bit about that might be a question in the future, but that was not a question currently on the survey. Okay. Other comments or questions? Okay, if the motion maker would, please make sure to read it as presented in the s staff memorandum. And do I have a motion? Mr. Flynn, no, you need to read it. I <laughs> know <laughs> <laughs> that's a tall order. Yeah. <laughs> I move to approve the proposed targets for peak hour of excessive delay, FED, and non-single occupancy vehicle, SOV, travel targets, as part of the performance-based planning requirements of the Fixing America Surface Transportation FAST Act. Okay, do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. Are there any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor by aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the results from our outstanding and very independent accounting firm. I've received the envelope back. I have opened the envelope and I am proud to announce that we have two members who have been selected to be our uh, members of the RTC. May I welcome Director Rakowski and Director Beacom. Thank you. Now that we have the results, we do actually need a motion to accept them. So may I have a motion, Mr. Flynn? I make a motion to accept them, as, and I was expecting you to read La La Land at the last minute. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I have a motion. Do we have a second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, by aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? If not, gentlemen, welcome. We'll see you at 8, eight o'clock on the mornings of the meetings. <laughs> Ms. Stolzman. Just a point of order. Do we need to designate the rest of the candidates as alternates to the RTC? Yes. yes. I would move that we designate the remainder of the candidates as alternates to the RTC. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Can we clarify that the candidates include people that we weren't voting on? Everybody that expressed an interest, which is a longer list than what was up on the board. I'll accept the friendly amendment. Okay, I have a motion with an amendment. Do we have a second? We have a motion with a second and an amendment. All those in favor of the motion as presented, please like to signify by aye. aye. Any opposed? We have alternates and we have voting members. Alternates, you are always are welcome to attend the meeting. We encourage it so you can understand what's going on. But uh, typically what they will do several days, uh, as Mr. Teal and some of us who have served alternates before, typically we'll reach out uh, to the voting members to make sure they're going to be present. And if anybody is not, then they start going down the list of the alternates, working from those closest in to the facility so there's the least amount of travel time because sometimes that may not be until the night before. So it depends upon what happens with our voting members. So thank all of you for your willingness to serve and we'll move on. Hi. 
<laughs> I'm just tomorrow. <laughs> good evening. It's not like we've been um, meeting a lot the last yeah. few days. Go ahead, Mr. Martin. Um, good evening, everybody. I think uh, we're, this takes us to uh, attachments K and L in your agendas. Um, first one is uh, status of bills that you've taken position on before, and the second one is new bills. And there's also a, a, a sheet of one more new bill that was put in front of you. It was it came out after the packet went out. We, I think Connie sent it out on Monday, but we printed out an extra sheet for you. I'm not going to say anything about the new bills, I mean the old bills, unless somebody has a question. I'm happy to answer. Uh, but we've got a lot to discuss on the, uh, on the new bills. Um, particularly the transportation bills. So what I'd like to do, with your permission, is to first ask for positions on two aging bills, and then we can go back and discuss the transportation bills. So if that's okay, the two aging bills would be um, House Bill 1315 in your packet and House Bill 1380, which is uh, uh, on the table in front of you. Um, and we're asking for support on both bills, uh, house, and they're both really housing, affordable housing related bills in a way. Um, the first one is, uh, would exempt manufactured homes from sales tax, and um, it's already passed out of its first house and is sitting in appropriations, and it helps reduce the cost of, uh, of uh, new purchases of, of, uh, of mobile homes. and. Um, the second one, uh, House Bill 1380, uh, the, the title, the short title bill is somewhat misleading, but it basically refers to a program that the state has operated by the Department of Revenue, and I've mentioned this, I think, at the last board meeting, uh, called the PTC rebate, which um, provides a small stipend or rebate back to low-income seniors and disabled persons to offset the costs for property taxes paid uh, and, or, and or for uh, rental expenses and heating expenses. And uh, the amounts, uh, the rebate amounts themselves were last increased in 2014 and um, so this bill would increase those to account for inflation since then and then index those amounts for inflation going forward. Uh, there's very small amounts. I think the maximum someone can get uh, for the, the rent or property tax rebate is like $700 a year. And the average that people actually get is, is, is closer to around $320. Um, and, and the increases in this bill would be, a, um, I don't have the details if, we, if I can get them in front of me if you need to have them. but. Um, it's really basically to, to uh, bring this small assistance uh, for keeping low-income seniors and disabled in, in the community, living in the community and making sure that those amounts keep up with inflation. So those, those are the two bills that I'd like to see if we could get a motion for support on, but I'm obviously happy to answer questions. Comments or questions on, from the staff? Or from the uh, members of the board on the two bills that are being proposed for support positions. Seeing none, could we have a motion to support the two as uh, presented by staff? I have a motion and I have a second. Any other comments or questions on the two proposed support positions as presented by staff? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? One, two, three. Four, five. I have five abstaining. Motion still carries on a voice vote. Now let's get to Thank the tough you. one. Yes, now we get to the transportation. Yes. So um, I'm going to make a couple of comments uh, to kind of tee this up. I'm asking our lobbyists, particularly Jennifer Castle and, and, and uh, Ed Bowditch, to uh, back her up there because they have some, uh, some new information for us. Um, but I wanted to give a quick uh, update on the two bills and kind of uh, make a suggestion of how we might move forward and then turn it over to them and, and also to uh, uh, Chairman Atchison and, uh, and uh, Executive Director Rex. So first of all, get my notes here. Um, 
we have a, a, a position right now of monitor on Senate Bill 1, and um, in your packet is a request for board direction on Senate Bill 1340. And quickly, I think you all know this, but Senate Bill 1 is the bill that um, started in the Senate, obviously, and uh, was amended significantly in second reading uh, and, and is now sitting in House Transportation. We think it may be heard uh, next week on the 25th of Tuesday, 25th, uh, 25th of next week. Yep. It's not officially on the calendar, but that's what we're hearing. Um, it's, mended, it's been amended significantly. I've got all kinds of stuff in front of me, but like Jacob said earlier, if you've got easy questions, <laughs> otherwise hopefully others around here uh, can, can ask what, what Senate Bill 1 as amended does. Uh, but I know there's been some concerns from, uh, from local governments uh, about that. Uh, the also, uh, House Bill 1340, which was part of the uh, budget package, included, I guess it's $495 million, uh, one-time money for this year for transportation. The House put in a, a detailed distribution of how that money would be uh, allocated, and I think it broke down essentially to 35 percent to CDOT, 25 percent each to counties and municipalities, and 15 percent to multimodal. Uh, I believe the language in that bill pretty much mirrors what was in House Bill 1242 from last year, so if you can remember that, it's that similar. When that got over to the Senate, that was all stripped out. Uh, that bill is, uh, so obviously there's a difference between the two houses. That bill is sitting in conference committee, uh, probably waiting to see what happens with Senate Bill 1 in the House. In the meantime, uh, we've had meetings with two of the uh, sort of primary figures in, in these issues over the last uh, week and a half, uh, Director Atchison and uh, Doug and uh, Ron and myself and Jennifer met uh, with uh, Rachel Zenzinger to talk about uh, the Senate Bill 1, and then we met uh, this past Monday with Representative Winter, who's of course the chairman of House Transportation and is involved in uh, what uh, the House plans to do on this bill. And uh, we've got a little bit, I think I maybe at this point I'll, I'll, I'll get ready to turn it over to Jennifer, but I wanted to tee up a couple of other things that after she's done, I'm going to ask uh, Doug and, and uh, Chairman Atchison to uh, talk about a little bit. So first of all, um, we would like to take, have the board take a, an official position on those, both of those bills and, and, and recommending, and obviously this, this will be part of your debate, recommending that uh, you take a position of support with amendments. Obviously there's, there's been a lot of discussion, particularly about Senate Bill 1, uh, and give staff direction to support or oppose amendments and ultimately those bills based on direction from the um, Board of Officers. Understanding that we've got two weeks left in the session, things are going to move very quickly, different ideas, different proposals may pop up, and we're going to need to weigh in on a fairly short notice. So that's, what, that's, that's a kind of a two-part uh, or two suggestions uh, for you. And then um, the third one is maybe to help inform those decisions that staff and lobbyists and uh, officers make is you might want to adopt some basic principles for the for us to move it, you know board principles for us moving forward and some of the ones that we've talked about that would suggest would be one of the main concerns in the Senate bill is the restrictions that it places on tolling so we would want to oppose any re restrictions on tolling uh, we'd also want to increase local share, similar to what's in the House bill, and increase funding for multi multimodal, in the, particularly in the one-time funding that's being uh, uh, proposed there. And I'm going to throw one last one in that I haven't discussed with anybody yet. <laughs> but I was reading back through House Bill 1340 and noticed that as it did in 1242 last year, it also has a provision in there that under all these different multimodal possible uh, uses of the money, an eligibility for a senior and disabled transportation in there. And as an area agency on aging, I think Dr. Uh, Jayla certainly would, would want to have you support 
and allow us to support, if possible, that being kept in, in that funding there. So I figured I should bring that up. But with that, uh, I'm going to let uh, Jen give some updates of what she's heard as of this afternoon of what might be going on in the House with Senate Bill 1. Uh, unless there's any questions at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jen. Jen, go ahead. Okay. There's going to be a lot of questions afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully they're easy ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you all. Good evening. So as of about 4 o'clock this afternoon, I had a good conversation with Representative Faith Winter, as Rich mentioned. She is the chair of the House Transportation um, Committee. Um, according to her, what the House Democrats would like to do to Senate Bill 1 is essentially redo the whole thing, um, put out a strike below amendment, just as was done in the Senate. Um, their main concern is they want to change the bill from a bonding bill to a spending bill. And how um, Representative Winter wants to do that is that um, she wants to create a five-year um, funding plan for transportation, which, it, which is currently in Senate Bill 1 and in 1340, a dedication of either $495 million or $500 million for this coming fiscal year, for fiscal year 1819. After that, it is her plan to put in roughly $140 million per year for the next uh, five years, which would total somewhere around up. 1.2 billion over the next six years that we would, that we would see. Um, in addition, she would remove the prohibition on managed lanes. Um, she would also work on the local share. She made it made it um, very clear to us in a meeting that we had with her um, that she, as well as the House Democrats, are dedicated to put more money um, back to the locals so that we have more local share. She said the minimum that their caucus is willing to accept would follow the lines of the HUTF allocation, um, which is 65, 22, 18. So that would be the minimum. Um, I think ideally they'd like to get back to the percentage um, that, it, that was in House Bill 1340, which is the 35, 25, 25, 15 split. But she's not quite sure if we, if we can get there, or excuse me, if they can get there as of yet. Um, they're hoping to have the governor's support on this. I think they're still waiting to hear if the governor will support or not. The w one key caveat with this as well, too, in order to allocate the $140 million for the next five years, starting in fiscal year 1920, the budget st stabilization factor, otherwise known as the negative factor, would need to remain flat. Um, that way, if she can get other members of her caucus to support increased funding for transportation as long as there's no hit to K-12 education. So, Rich, I think that is about all of the update I, I have. Again, if the House does this, they, they're in the majority in the House. If they pass this, it would have to go back to the Senate for a conference committee. And she has not had any conversations with the Senate as of yet um, to see if they would approve of this spending plan rather than a bonding plan. Okay. Let me finish up the comments up here, then I'll open it up for questions. So stand by just a minute. Doug, you want to go ahead? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, and Jen, thank you very much for the information. That was consistent with what we've heard, and I'm, I'm glad there. We've got something to talk about. Um, as you all know, and Rich may have mentioned this, I mean, the board is not going to meet again until after the session is over. So what we would like to do um, at your pleasure, of course, is come up with some principles that you feel comfortable with, uh, what, the, what you believe that a, uh, a bill should, should contain and allow us to, um, um, you know, to work, um, you know, with the executive committee, um, a smaller group of five, obviously, to, um, to make sure that we're, we're on the right page, that they, you know, that they um, uh, represent your views on that um, so we can go over to the Capitol and, and express what you would like to ha have in that bill. So. Um, you know, and I think uh, Rich has really laid out exactly what it is ex we're talking about here. Is primarily the local share. It's the removal of the restriction on the on um, on toll or managed lanes. Um, what's the other one? There was multimodal. Mo the multimodal pot. So basically, you know, we're, you know, I think the board was supportive of the board. We took a position of of support of 1242 last year. So we're really looking at the same concepts and principles as what was presented um, in year past. So to try to get everybody up to speed, this this has not stood still for five minutes. It has been moving hourly, if not less than an hour. Uh, 
as Rick talked about, uh, we met with both the leaderships that are on the transportation side, not necessarily the Speaker or the President of the Senate. And I don't know if they're going to get there. Quite honestly with you, there's still a lot of room in between. They have also been uh, asking the Metro mayors to come out on a position. Uh, we have met and talked about that. As many of you know, we've been very steadfast in wanting the 1%, the one cent tax. Metro mayors has agreed to move off of that because the polling and the coalition that's trying to get a statewide ballot can't support the one cent. We have gone back to a position that we had when we had 1242 last year to the 0.62. That's where we are today. The issues that continue to arise between the different versions of bills coming back and forth is, one, there has to be a local share of the counties and the municipalities, and there has to be a multimodal in it. So neither the coalition nor our metro mayors will support anything that doesn't contain that. For the metro mayors, we also have to see a revenue stream to pay for the bonding that they want to have because we can't just continue to keep taking it out of general fund when we don't know it's going to be there. And with it being in the general fund, that can always be taken away on a yearly basis. We've already got a commitment in 267 that has to take 90 million, 100 million out of the general fund to add to CDOT's budget, but that's based upon an annual appropriations out of the general fund. It's not guaranteed. So we still have the same issue of right now we're up in the air. The coalition has been advised of the new position by Metro mayors. They have uh, been advised of what's going on at the Capitol as of the last minute they get their updates. We are meeting together as a coalition again on Thursday to try to hammer out a last minute issue of where they are going to go with the ballot. Keep in mind they have four titles still approved, the fifth one actually. Uh, and the fifth one is a point three, two or three, 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 five. three, five. three five, yeah. And it's predicated around the one-time $500 million fund that's in the governor's budget. So it deals with that one. Otherwise, you have two ballot titles at a point five. You have a point six two and a point one zero. Oh. And we are agreeing with them to one get off the, uh, the one point zero. Oh. To get off the one point zero. Oh. It just won't poll. So that is continuing to work through the process. Um, because of the fact that the session ends next week, or I'm sorry, in, 20, in 23 days, 23, 24 days, the fact that the committee hearing from the House is on the 25th, and we've been asked to be there as a part of the hearing by the chair of the House Transportation Committee to present our position. Amendments are still being worked out. As Jennifer and them said, there is discussion between the speaker and the governor as to what he may or may not support. That resolution we were hoping to have by 6 o'clock tonight, and that did not happen. So that means this is going to go back and forth between the House and the Senate. In order to react to what's going on with the changes between now and the time they hear it on Thursday of next week, we need some way to be able to react, and we can't go chasing 58 people to try to get a reaction and explain all this through email. So what has been proposed by staff is a resolution from the group to allow between the staff, our lobbyists, and your five board officers to represent the position of Dr. Cog at the hearing next week. Depending upon what amendments we hear, what comes out of the governor's office, and what meets the principles of what we've been saying we would support. So that will be one of the actions we'll be asking you to take a position on tonight. So at this point, I'll open up the conversation, and we'll start with Ms. Jones. So um, I thank you, her, by, or Director Atchison. Um, I agree strongly with where the Metro Mayor's Caucus was going with their principles. Those principles are very similar to the US 36 mayors and commissioners coalition principles, and also um, the CCAT uh, county coalitions principles around that. So I, I'm, and whenever we're ready, I'm happy to put a motion on the table if we need one. I see them, just to be clear, sort of four-pronged. 
no bonding without new revenue, substantial proportion for, for multimodal, substantial proportion going to local share, and no prohibition on tolling. And my one sort of uh, fine tuning, and this is really a question for Jennifer, can we ensure in these discussions or make clear our position that the share for multimodal and the share for local governments applies not just to the $500 million one time, but for the entire multi-year stream? Because I think that would be an important component. Yes, and it is my understanding that that is what the House Democrats want to do. As of right now, they, they are committed to having the 35-25-25-15 split on the $495 million for next year. The local share is still being worked out on the $140 million moving forward. Well, so I guess I would just put a fine point on what I would propose is I think the Dr. Cog position should be local share and multimodal for the $500 million and the $140 million for each year going out. Okay. Mr. Rakowski. You know, I've been here for a long time and seen a lot of board officers. And I think we are particularly blessed this cycle with the executive committee we have, particularly in the chairman, who probably knows more than the sum total, knows more in the sum total of knowledge on transportation than most of the state legislature. So I have great faith in him and the executive director and the other members of the executive team, and I think uh, we should support them, uh, the motion to have them uh, speak for us. Okay. Other comments? Guys, get, get comfortable with this because this is going to move really fast and it's, it's going to change a lot between now and next week. <laughs> we, we still are not sure what some of the conversations in the back rooms are doing right now. And I know I, I talked to Jennifer this morning, asked her to go down and talk to the uh, chair of the House. We get, we're getting what we can as fast as we can. We came here tonight hoping we'd have something from the governor's office. We were pretty well assured that they were working it. It just didn't happen. Uh, so I, I want to make sure the group is, is very comfortable with what we're asking to do because when we go down there, we want to make sure we're speaking for the group. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Wheelock, go ahead. Uh, at least with regard to your um, um, no prohibition on tolling, how does that affect managed lanes? I was that was shorthand for um, opposing the uh, amendment that went on in the Senate that would basically prohibit managed lanes. And so no, yeah. So so there would be no prohibition on managed lanes specifically. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Could I ask a question before you make the motion official? Would it be better to, to make it a little broader to say no restrictions? Because the way I read the, uh, I mean, it, it, the, the, the language in the bill, it, it may effectively prohibit managed lanes, but it talks about having CDOT do a study and make findings and so forth before they proceed with any. That's a good clarification, yeah. Okay. All right, any other comments or discussions? Then I'd like to make a motion on the table. Put a motion on the table, and that would be to um, direct our lobbying team and the board officers and executive director to advocate Dr. Cog's position on these bills um, around the principles of no bonding without new revenue, must contain a substantial local share, and a substantial multimodal share that um, is in both the first year and all, all six years and that there be no restrictions on tolling or managed lanes. Hang on just a second. Let me make sure we've got it all. I cover everything we need. I'm, I'm going to ask Connie. I've been, I, oh, 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 does it cover every, I see Yeah, the principal. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. Mr. Teal. Well, I'd like to speak against the motion then, because I think as, com, as uh, you know, Commissioner Zabo mentioned, this was the first bill introduced. I mean, it's already going through all the, it, 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 you know, it, it really won't move very fast if we keep throwing additional things at it. I realize that there are fundamental ideological problems that people have with Senate Bill 1, 
but the bottom line is it's heading towards a slow and painful death but with the amendments that are we've heard will be proposed in the house that are just not going to make it through the senate so i would speak against the motion and my intention would be to vote no um, it's it's uh i don't know how effective our participation will be as long as we're locking in on those three principles but let me clarify this, the hearing on next week includes 1340 that's the house version so it's not just that we're going to hear about sb1 we're going to hear about the transportation bills just to make sure everybody understands this is just not one bill we understand that the house bill Okay, we understand that the House bill is still being discussed, but the Senate bill is the one that's going to probably, as you're pointing out, uh, Mr. Teal, has is, is got a bigger problem. But we've got to get something between those two in the hearings and get something moved either to get rid of it, kill it all, go back to conference, whatever they're going to do. Our last conversation opportunity with them will be next week. Right. And Mr. Chairman, my, my comments in opposition to the motion still stand. Okay, no problem. Ms. Castle, yep, Ms. Thank, Thomas, I'll come back to you in a second. Thank you, Director Atchison. Um, just one clarification. Um, House Bill 1340 is a JVC-sponsored bill, and they are waiting for the House and Senate to act on Senate Bill 1 prior to them making any kind of um, decision on House Bill 1340. I think that's cut. If who doesn't act? I'm sorry, Director Zabo. Oh, if... If nothing happens with Senate Bill 1, House Bill 1340 will be the transportation the funding bill. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Thomas? So we'll, both, we'll be acting on both of them, not necessarily in the same meeting, but we'll, both of them are in play. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. While there's lots of information in the motion that's on the floor, I certainly understand the reason to have a smaller group acting quickly and nimbly. Um, I can support that, but I cannot support a substantial multimodal as one of our principles. Okay. Other comments? Ms. Christman. Particularly since um, Dr. Cog has been asked um, and that the transportation bill affects this group, I think it would be inappropriate for us not to be speaking and uh, not to be involved in the process. Uh, in addition, I think the best we can do is get a consensus based on a vote of what the principles are and go from there. Okay. Other comments? All right, the motion right now includes the four principles. I know we have two people who object to at least one principle or another in the piece. Depending upon the majority vote of those casting ballots or votes tonight, we will present whatever is carried to for as a majority vote. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Point of clarification. So really the, the motion on the table also serves as guiding principles mm -hmm. for the officers who are representing this body. Right. And so they really operate at, the, at their discretion, right, to try to interpret that and move and adjust the information that is before them at the moment. And so I have full faith and confidence that the, uh, the officers can take that motion, right, and, and lever that appropriately given the dynamic situation. So I don't see that as gospel. I see that as a guideline, and I'm comfortable supporting the motion as it stands. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? You want extensions for me? Okay. All right. Because we need to get to a certain number. Is there anyone who is, would like to abstain from voting tonight? Please raise your hand. I saw one abstention. Is there any others? All right. And so that we can try to make sure we've got the correct account. All those in favor of the motion as stated, please raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Those opposed? One, two, three, four, four, six. Okay, the motion passes on a majority vote. Folks, we'll do what we can. Was there, was there a second? Yes, yes, there was. Okay. okay, motion passes on a majority vote.
thank you for your time and we'll move to the next one and I think that's all you had right now. that is all I have thank you okay let's move to the committee reports miss Jones on the uh, attack please Yes, a uh, couple things on the st uh, t stack. We had uh, Wade Buchanan, who's the governor's new senior advisor on aging, give a presentation that sounded like Jayla, only not quite as passionate, but very eager to work on uh, mobility for seniors. We received an update on the federal omnibus funding bill that passed in March that includes some additional transportation funding, t uh, grants for Tiger, small starts, new starts, that kind of thing. So that was somewhat more optimistic than than we have been at the federal level we got an update on the safe routes to school program there's going to be 10 projects funded in 2018 and then probably one of the biggest things CDOT is working to um, develop its transit project list and is consulting with Dr. Cog and the other MPOs and TPRs to make sure that the list is complete and right our local governments, all local governments are also allowed to weigh in directly with CDOT to make sure that list is right and they want to get it done by the summer so that it's ready for any ballot initiative that might move. So if you all have transit or transit wishes, make sure be in conversation with CDOT on that. Um, and then beyond that, um, CDOT's finished the phase one of the statewide TDM plan and is hoping to complete phase two this summer. And then last but not least, um, the, there is an autonomous mobility task force. And by the legislation that passed on this in 2017, CDOT's going to have to report each year regarding the testing of these vehicles in Colorado. So stay tuned on that. And who covered the county commissioners? Is that you also, Elise? Right. Ms. Thomas, you want to cover it, please? Sorry, Commissioner Partridge asked me to relay that. Broomfield hosted us. It was a very nice meeting, and we talked about um, emergency management. So thank you to Broomfield. Okay. Mr. Rex, Rack. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, I got you. We had we, uh, several items. The first was uh, there was an update on the, on the search for the executive director. I think I mentioned at several meetings um, in the past that, that – uh, Longtime executive director of the Regional Air Quality Council, Ken Lloyd, has announced his retirement. Um, the, there is a job notice that's that's out right now, and uh, res resume, excuse me, and letters of interest are are asked for by May 18th at five o'clock for anybody that's interested or anybody you may know that might be interested. Um, we had a very interesting presentation on uh, transport and uh, chemist and chemistry modeling in the in the, the um, in the Front Range area. Uh, it was based on a FRAPE study that was done uh, uh, a couple years back. Um, so that, that was very interesting, at least it was to me. Uh, it was a, quite an education. Um, and we also had a presentation on um, the um, AQCC, Air Quality Control Commission. They are, um, they are submitting to EPA an exceptional uh, e event um, as a result of some uh, uh, wild, wildfire um, uh, wildfires that were that occurred in September of 2017, in which we had a uh, high ozone associated with that. So, um, so we're curious for them to. Um, well, we're 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 anxious for them to get that to EPA so that um, it would help us with our air quality uh, monitoring last year. Those those were the. That, that was it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Rakowski for E47, if you would. Probably the most significant news I've ever had to report. Adams County. Rappo County, Douglas County, in 1988, when Commissioner Henry was still in junior high. <laughs> passed a vehicle registration fee of ten dollars per vehicle every year. That was the revenue source for a approximately seventy-five million dollar bond plus interest. Well, guess what? The bonds get paid off in August, the end of August. And thanks to Mr. Dyack, who was there voting, and others, and Mr. Beacom. No, Mr. Beacom didn't vote. He, he's not voting. He was there, but we're only <laughs> voted to keep faith with the voters, as was promised that when the bonds were paid off, the tax, uh, excuse me, the registration fee would go away, and it will go away. The board voted unanimously to stop collecting it uh, effective September 1st. So I think the lesson here 
is to remember when we make promises to the voters, we need to follow through. And I think what's important here is there was nobody who, uh, in terms of elected officials on that board that proposed it in 1988 that's still around to, to vote. And so the folks that now are around who voted kept faith with that bond and contract with the voters and the elected officials on the board. And I think and I, I would commend those people for voting unanimously to end the registration fee. And the other news is that the next widening project the design contract was approved, so we're looking forward to keeping ahead of the congestion on E-470 by um, authorizing uh, the uh, development of additional lanes. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mamneter. At their planning, capital programs, and fast tracks committee meeting earlier this month, the RTD board had one action item related to fast tracks, and it was the acquisition of some additional property rights needed for the North Metro commuter rail project. That was approved by the board of directors formally last night at their meeting. It's the only thing related to fast tracks, but there are three other quick updates I'd like to provide regarding our TD. One, 16th Street Mall, NEPA analysis being led by the city and county of Denver in partnership with RTD and the downtown Denver partnership. The NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act analysis and alternatives analysis is moving along and we anticipate releasing it to the public for review in June. So I wanted to provide that update. Second is State Highway 119 bus rapid transit update between Boulder and Longmont on the diagonal. That project is moving along and we anticipate substantial completion, identification of alternatives and environmental clearance uh, by early next year. And finally, our board of directors is really starting to delve into the recommendations presented by the past program working group regarding fares and fair changes and fair structures um, for the RTD system and to that end at a study session next Tuesday, Tuesday the 24th, they will be, um, well, delving into it even more. So just wanted to provide those updates, not directly related to fast tracks, but of potential interest to this body. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ms. Warren. We have not had our meeting yet, but I wanted to give you an update today. Remember I told you about the assisted living regulations that our uh, lead ombudsman, Shannon Gimbel, was the chair of the committee to develop these regulations, and legislative efforts were put in place to try and stop them, but the Board of Health passed um, the regulations today unanimously, so that's a huge success for us and for the folks living in assisted living. That's all. And as far as with Metro mayors, I think we discussed that during the conversation around transportation. Mr. Graves, you got something? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Actually, something that ties to the Metro Mayor's Caucus meeting and a request to this body. So during the Metro Mayor's Caucus meeting, there was also a presentation by the U.S. Census Bureau. As we all know, the 2020 Census is coming up, and I just wanted to uh, actually request potentially that we have a briefing here for this body. Last week I was at a meeting of UASI. You may know it's a regional body of emergency managers and first responder personnel where we prioritize uh, grant funding allocations for emergency equipment for our respective jurisdictions. And one of the things that would grow our pie for safety equipment is a greater count of our populace. And so every person counts when it comes to the, the projects that we care about in our community and how we provide services. So I think it would be great to have a briefing here. Thank you. Okay. Other comments from any member of the board? If not, drive safely. We are adjourned. <laughs>